I was so lucky to be invited to go to the opening of the museum in Fort Worth. What a spectacular place. How did you pick Fort Worth as the location? Well, I had nothing to do with that. I'm going to give all the credit to my, my younger brother, Ethan. Um, and by the way, this museum, this display, John Wayne and American Experience in the Fort Worth Stockyards, is the third iteration. We, start, we did one in Nashville at the Gaylord and um, got our feet wet there. And then we had another display in, the, in, in Las Vegas. Uh, and then uh, Fort Worth Stockyards was chosen because Patrick Gotts, who has the Cowboy Channel and RFD TV, um, uh, partnered with Ethan on this deal, and they got the property, they got the, you know, the site where the museum is, and um, so it worked out that way. So part of it was because of um, the, the association with Patrick Gotch. The fact is, there couldn't be a better place. It really, I mean, Fort Worth Stockyards and John Wayne, I mean, it's a perfect fit. Uh, we, we've, it's been open a year, and they have had like 55,000 paid people go through this and every single one of them, I mean, I haven't been there the whole time, but I've been there quite a few times, and everybody seems to really enjoy it. And my own personal experience, and I can say this because I had nothing to do with this, my, my brother was like in charge of setting all this stuff up, and it's an amazing, it's a comprehensive museum. It's got his, his, his public life, his professional life, his private life, completely covers everything. You go through this, this museum and you see all of it. They're really interesting things. You could spend quite a lot of time in there if you just stopped and listened to all of the videos and all the audio, all the stuff. Anyway, it's some, some inter interaction things too. Uh, and, and then at the end, um, it's a spoiler alert if you're going to go. I mean, I'm not going to spoil anything. But at the end, uh, we have his legacy on there, which when... Um, when my father passed away, my brothers and sisters and I decided as a legacy to him that we would um, use his name to create awareness about cancer in terms of education and fundraising in terms of cancer for cancer research. And we started this in, in, in 1980 and had no idea that how long this was going to last. I mean, how long are they, people going to remember? You know, I'm telling you, his name today has as much resonance as it did in 1979 when he passed away, if not more. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. Because I know members of the Wayne family, and I've written a lot about John Wayne in the past, about... Three months before the museum did its unofficial opening, I got contacted by Ethan Wayne, said we could really use some help in proofreading and writing some of the display exhibit, you know, descriptions for, for the museum. I started pulling out all my John Wayne and John Ford books and looking for things that were appropriate. And uh, they seemed to really like what I was coming up with, so I wound up writing a reasonable number of, of those exhibit, you know, plaques that are next to each one giving a, a little bit of a brief description. This memorabilia, most people do not save everything, but boy, it looks like everything that anybody could think of for Duke. I mean, first edition books of True Grit. Uh, did you go through the memorabilia as well? A lot of the memorabilia was already set up when I first saw what was there. And so, you know, I, I made a few recommendations about cor corrections and things like that. So, you know, I'd say 90% of it was spot on. And there were just a few things that uh, looked like they would fit, but they didn't. So an example would be like in the case with the books. So there's the book from Hondo that was done from the, the screenplay. There is uh, a book called Rio Grande there. Now, you would think that would have been from the movie Rio Grande. And I was like, it's a hardback. It didn't look right. So I took a photo of it so I'd know the author's name, looked it up, and it turned out it was published five years after the movie came out. It had nothing to do with the movie. It was a history book on the history of the Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico. So it looks right but it really has nothing to do with it. The costumes and the outfits that Duke wore, everything seems to be put together in such a great chronological order. That's just a small part of what Ethan has in storage. 
And so, you know, at a certain time, they're going to be able to to uh, trade out things and show different things that uh, people haven't seen in a long time. And then there'll be the iconic things like the shootest uh, uh, costume, the horse soldier's costume, Rio Bravo and El Dorado that, you know, you want to keep as, as real standards. So, uh, so eventually there'll be things that will be new to the exhibit. And, and probably the most interesting that requires a, uh, an explanation is the big sacks of mail that are in the big crate. Because those are letters that came to John Wayne after he had passed away. So they had been mailed in most cases before he had passed away, so they weren't condolences of the family. And John Wayne had a reputation for returning all of his correspondence. If you wrote him, you were going to get a return letter, which I can attest to personally, because when I was in college, I wrote a letter to John Wayne about the Alamo, which was one of my favorite films. And several months later, I got a personal reply. Wow. Why do you think his legacy is still so important today? He wasn't just America's movie star. He was the rest of the world's idea of what the ideal American was. And John Wayne would have been the first one to tell you, I'm not a hero. I play a hero up on camera. And so, you know, it was an appealing... He wasn't a superhero. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but I think it was somebody like one of his directors. It wasn't John Ford who said, you know... He's like your neighbor that was always there to help you out. He was, he was the guy who would rescue the cat that was trapped up in the, in the tree. He was the guy that would look out, you know, for a kid that was being bullied and tell a bully to knock it off. You know, he had that kind of strength and power, but still in a kind of impish, you know, humor to him as well in this big man's, you know, body. And he represented what I think we want Americans to be recognized as. When you say a big man, tell us about the car that we see in the museum. Because John Wayne was six foot four, and when he was in a standard size car, he, he hit his head and he couldn't wear hardly a baseball cap or certainly not a cowboy hat. And so uh, he asked the manufacturer to, you know, have something custom done that they would increase the height of, of the, uh, the cab. And so uh, that's how that came about. Well, it'd be pretty hard to hide who you are driving down the street in that car. Ethan Wayne has some wonderful stories about his dad putting him on his lap, driving from Newport Beach up to, to L.A. for a meeting, and he'd bring Ethan with him and let Ethan steer I think all fathers do that. <laughs> the book Hondo that we see in the display case, did that come out after the movie? Uh, the book Hondo definitely came out after the film. The backstory to that is there was a short story by Louis L'Amour called A Gift from Cochise. Didn't have Hondo, didn't have much with a little boy, uh, just had a little bit with Cochise. And they bought the rights to that. Lamore was basically an unknown writer at that time. And James Edward Grant, Bat Jack, John Wayne's company's favorite writer, who was a wonderful writer, he wrote the screenplay. He created so much of that. Grant had a wonderful Western history library, even though he was a former crime journalist from Chicago. And so he created the character of Hondo. He created all those situations. They gave the script to Louis Lamore and said, write a novelization of the script. So really, it should have, you know, James Edward Grant's name also there. What other films did uh, Grant write for John Wayne? Uh, Angel and the Bad Man, uh, The Sands of Iwo Jima. He also wrote uh, for Wayne, and probably the best known is The Alamo. What was it about The Alamo and the history of uh, Davy Crockett that made John Wayne so passionate about that, that film. The Alamo was a lifelong dream of John Wayne's to get made. He spent 15 years of his own time and money trying to get it off the ground, and he said, I know how it should be done. And he loved the idea of the sacrifice of 
common Americans, Texans, Tejanos, against a dictatorship. When he finally had raised the money, because at the time in 1959 when it was filmed, it was the most expensive American production done. It was a $12 million budget. It was actually shot in the United States. So they built the set exactly as close as they could get. They built the Alamo. They actually reversed the direction of the Alamo because that gave them extra hours of daylight. And so that was the reason it doesn't you know, aim in the right direction, really. Because it was his lifelong dream, he said, I need to direct. United Artists was very, very hesitant about this. They said, okay, you're producing, we'll let you direct, but you have to play one of the major roles. He wanted to just do a cameo as Sam Houston, but the role of Davy Crockett suited him about the best of any of the three of Colonel Travis, Jim Bowie, and Davy Crockett. And it's a film that film critics tend to look down their nose a bit, but audiences love. You know, whenever it's shown on, on any of the streaming stations now, and back when it was, it was on cable, uh, there would always be great response. The battle scenes are incredibly done. No CGI in those films, in the, the battle scenes at all. And uh, it would be hard to duplicate that today. They had a thousand extras. They had this incredible set. And it all shows up on screen. All of the wonderful photographs, uh, so many of them are rare and unseen before that are blown up as huge wall displays. One of my favorite Wayne photographs that really is kind of important to the image of Wayne on screen is of John Wayne with Sammy Davis Jr. And Sammy Davis Jr. has John Wayne's famous cavalry hat that he wore in the John Ford movies, he wore in Rio Bravo. Sammy Davis Jr. was going off to do Sergeants 3. And Sammy Davis Jr. was a tremendous Western fan. And the people that know about quick draw back in those days, Sammy Davis Jr. may have been the fastest quick draw guy in Hollywood. He made that part of his nightclub act at one point. So John Wayne loaned him his cavalry hat as the character because the character Sammy was playing was a former slave that wants to be a cavalry trooper. And he plays the trumpet. And anyone who knows this film, Sergeants 3, knows that it's really Gunga Din, the famous adventure film from the 1930s, moved up to a U.S. cavalry movie. And so when Wayne loaned him the hat... The, uh, they had to put newspaper inside the lining of the hat brim so it would fit Sammy. Well, every time Frank Sinatra or Dean Martin or Peter Lawford, the co-stars, would walk by Sammy, they would pull the hat down over his eyes and go, John Wayne, huh? And it broke out the part of the crown down here that was already kind of fragile and that made John Wayne retire that hat when he got it back. But there's that wonderful photograph of John Wayne on the set of The Common Cheros with Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy has the hat on, and Sammy Davis Jr. has the biggest grin on his face like he's just a kid at Christmas. The, this birthday celebration and the official opening of, of the John Wayne Museum was a Hollywood, Texas celebration. So you had uh, people like Dean Smith, who was one of John Wayne's great stunt people on so many of his films there. You had Robert Fuller from Laramie and, and Wagon Train. You, you had people like the uh, owner-publisher of Cowboys and Indians, Greg Brown. And so there's a lot of Texas here. There was a lot of Hollywood here. Bruce Boxleitner from How the West Was Won was also here. And it was, it was just a fantastic party where everybody enjoyed celebrating John Wayne. And, you know, John Wayne's image was all over. Ethan Wayne did a great introduction to it all. Patrick Wayne, you know, the, old, the oldest surviving son today, was here, as was Melinda, his, uh, his sister. So John Wayne's daughter, who is from the first marriage, uh, was here as well. Marissa Wayne uh, one of the daughters from his, his last marriage was also here. On the one hand, kind of down home. On the other hand, you know, a real Texas celebration of, of John Wayne. <laughs> 